banjo with her. We're going to do two courses, and hopefully, I think everyone will know these. Jesus loves me in this little light of mine. So why don't everyone stand with me, please, and sing out nice and loud. And we'll do these two choruses before we take up the offering. Jesus loves me this hour. Next, you can get out your lights if you want to do the motions. If you're not doing the motions, then you have to sing twice as loud, okay? I'm sorry? Um, for Jesus loves me? Um, yeah. Um, refresh me. Even though weekend ill? Okay. Actually, that doesn't sound real familiar, but... Okay, second verse of Jesus loves me, nice and loud. Jesus loves me, loves me still. He Get your lights out. Do I have any kids who want to come up and help us with the motions? Do any of you know the, this little light? No? Okay. Caitlin, please. Caitlin and Cameron. <laughs> and Julie. Julie, you always say you're a kid at heart. Oh, here they come. We're going to do... A, Good job, guys. Thanks for coming. Tell everybody to get their lights up. Show them your lights. Everybody get your lights up. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Okay, I forgot. Thank you. Won't let Satan out. I'm going to let it shine. Won't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Yay. Good job, Helmers. Thank you. Good job. All right, we're going to um, take up the offering. I'll let you take over from here. <laughs> and once we pray for offering, you can be seated.
All right, the next song is going to be many songs. It's um, a hash chorus, and I think it's um, over a dozen different songs, church hymns and, and children's hymns as well, all combined one after the other. So I hope you know a majority of them. So if you know the song, just jump right in with me, okay? It starts with when the roll is called up yonder. trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more when the trump is eternal bright and fair when the saved on earth shall gather over on the other shore when the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder when the Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful place, but until then, my eyes will, whoops, but singing. Until then, with joy I'll carry on. Until the day my eyes behold that city. Until the day God calls me home. You know this one? This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my mother, not my father, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Sweet, ah, uh, let me, sweet, ah, uh, now I'm out of key. <laughs> See that? Um, now I'm all off on something. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at the Father's throne. Thank you for singing loud, Vicki.
I knew all the words when I practiced, but it's a little different singing up here in front of you all. <laughs> I thought you might request that. If you need the words, it's on page 333. I'll fly away. We'll finish up with that one. Why don't you all stand up so you don't fall asleep? Stand up, get the blood going. We'll sing I'll Fly Away, and then um, we'll do prayer and turn it over to Pastor. <clears throat> all right, nice and loud. Some glad morning when this life is over. Thank you all for singing with us. While Don, Don is uh, putting her banjo away, I just want to thank her for filling in for Tom this morning and, and uh, for singing tonight. She's such a blessing to our church. And uh, I want to thank her again. you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 3, we're going to launch in at verse 13, <clears throat> and we're going to relate this to what I've been preaching about for the last several weeks. Where have we been preaching, you remember? Joshua. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you were to study the scriptures, you would find that there are at least three significant things that happened at the Jordan River. The first one we've I've been preaching about for several weeks, where Joshua is leading 
<clears throat> excuse me, the children of Israel that have survived the wilderness, those that were less than 20 years old when they refused to go the first time, and also those that were born in that wilderness, Joshua was getting ready to take them across the Jordan into the promised land. There's another scripture, if you'd like to study this, it's found in 2 Kings, and it's the life of Elijah and Elisha, and something tremendous happened at the Jordan River that relates to what we've been preaching about. And then this scripture tonight also relates to that. So let's read beginning in verse 13 of chapter 3 of Matthew. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You may be seated. Now, I don't know, I don't guess there's any other preachers here tonight. Uh, but you teachers can no doubt relate to what I'm about to say. Have you ever been in a, and, and maybe just all of us can relate to this in some way as, as you study God's Word. Have you ever looked at a scripture and you know there's something there that God wants to give you and you just can't quite seem to sort it out? And, and you look at all the different scripture that pertains to that and you see everything and uh, at least that's where I'm at tonight and my prayer is that I won't confuse you, uh, that I will help sort out some things for you that will help you to understand better uh, the significance of when the children of Israel crossed that Jordan River into the promised land. So let's, uh, what do I always begin with? Let's review, okay, for just a minute. And I want to drive this home to you because I believe this is so important in your studies. If you were to look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament in there are what are called types and shadows of Jesus. Jesus is everywhere in the Old Testament. He just didn't come on the scene in Bethlehem. And as we look at the Old Testament, I had a preacher tell me one time, he used an illustration that made quite a bit of sense to me, and I'm not one who shoots a gun and goes hunting. But if you've ever shot a gun, you know that a gun, a rifle, has a foresight and a hindsight. And he said, you cannot hit a target if all you ever use is the foresight, that that's out on the barrel. But you've got to have a hindsight back there to line that foresight up with. Now, the hindsight is the Old Testament, and the foresight is the, uh, is the New Testament. So if you will think in those terms tonight and let me just take my time and hurry up, if that would be all right. Um, we have talked about how Moses brought the children of Israel out of bondage, took them through the Red Sea, and I, I want you to get this, it miraculously parted. Took them to the other side, they're now in a wilderness, and God wants to take them uh, to another body of water that they need to cross in order to get into the promised land. He, he being Moses, takes them to the Jordan River. He tells them that God wants them to go into this promised land, but Moses is not permitted to lead them into the land because if you read a little bit of Scripture, you'll find that Moses sinned and God said you can't go in the land because of that. 
But he took him to the top of Mount Pisgah and let him view over into that promised land. When Moses said to the children of Israel, we need you to, God wants you to be in the promised land. Remember how they sent 12 spies over into that promised land. They came back, and I'm sure you all know the story. If you've been here the last few weeks, you've heard it over and over and over again. The story was that 12 came back, 12 all agreed, beautiful land, uh, just, uh, just a wonderful land. God told us about it, and God was telling us the truth. And then 10 of them said, but there's giants over there, and we're afraid, and so we're we advise you that we not go over there, that we just stay here uh, in this safe area called the wilderness. The, there were two men, Joshua and Caleb, that had a different story. They said, we're well able to go into this land and we should go and take it because God wants us to have it and God will take care of the enemy that's over there. Well, as you know, Israel listened to the ten and they said, uh, we, we, we're not going to go. And Moses said, okay, but because you've chosen to disobey God, there's consequences that go with that. And those consequences in your case is that you will wander in this wilderness for every day that those spies viewed out that land. And how many days was that? Forty days. You're going to wander for each day a year. So you'll wander in this wilderness for 40 years. They do so. God miraculously feeds them. God miraculously gives them drink. He takes care of their, their clothing so that it doesn't decay. And he now, there comes this change of leadership. Moses is no longer going to be the one that leads them into the promised land. And I've told you the reason for that in a spiritual sense is that Moses represents the law. And I preached one time that there's three ways to heaven. One way to heaven would be obviously Jesus Christ, and we all know that's the only way. But when I preached it, I preached that there were two other ways to go to heaven. One was to be perfect and not make any mistakes whatsoever. And the Bible said there's none righteous, no, not one. And the other one, well, we won't even talk about that just now, but here's, here's the point I want to make. Here they come to this land, and the law, the commandments of God cannot get us over there because none of us have kept those commandments. The Bible said if you're guilty of one point, you're guilty of all. So if you've ever told a lie, you're just as guilty as someone who's committed adultery or murdered someone according to the Scripture and according to your standing with God. Sin is sin in the eyes of God. So now God gets them to the, to the brink of the Jordan River. Moses can't lead them over. And so Joshua has been sort of in the, uh, in the background up to this point. But Joshua now is chosen by God. And remember, the name Joshua here in the Hebrew language, which most of the Old Testament was written in, Joshua in the Hebrew, if you translate that into the Greek, which most of the New Testament was written in, uh, Joshua equates to Jesus. And so we see a perfect picture here of Jesus Christ. So we get to the brink of this river, and Joshua now has people that were either too young to be responsible in the wilderness the first time when Israel said no, or people that were born during this wilderness journey, and now they are at the brink of this river. And as you remember, Joshua says to, to the priests, the tribe of Levi, you get four men probably. He didn't say four. It's not in the Scripture that way. But you get some men, some Levites, that would lift up the Ark of the Covenant. If you remember this morning, I preached quite a bit on the Ark of the Covenant. It was 45 inches long. It was 27 inches deep this way and 27 inches high this way in our way of measuring things. If you were to look at that pretty closely, uh, as I shared with you this morning, the lid of the ark was called the mercy seat. It was made of pure gold. Now, the ark itself was made of acacia wood, and it was overlaid with gold. 
and that represented God. And the lid that goes on the top, the mercy seat, and I told you what is another name for mercy seat that I preached on this morning? Atonement. Atonement. And atonement means at one with God. And so on this mercy seat is where, remember, the priest would come once a year, the high priest, and he would sprinkle blood on the top of this mercy seat. Now, this has happened in the wilderness. God has given Moses the pattern of this, and now he's taken him, and I, I seem to kind of find myself going over this way when I'm talking about Jordan. And uh, so if this aisle way were the Jordan River, he says to those priests that have lifted up that Ark of the Covenant, the lid being the mercy seat, and all of the times, and if they were in this wilderness, I'm not sure how long after they were consigned to the wilderness that God gave them the pattern of the tabernacle, but it had to be pretty soon afterward because that was God's way of getting acquainted and establishing a relationship with His people. And so let's say that all of those 40 years that took place very early on when they started wandering, and so now they have had 40 years in the wilderness, and they have had a Passover for 40 of those years. So for 40 years, representing the Passover, that blood has been sprinkled on that mercy seat. And that blood, as I told you this morning, was never washed away. They were not allowed to touch that. Now, I didn't talk about this this morning, but think about your eternal salvation. If those Israelites would have been allowed to touch that mercy seat and to clean that blood off between times, those people would not have been covered by the blood. I'm glad that nothing can wash away the blood of Jesus. I'm glad that it is everlasting, it is eternal, it is it is. Nothing that man nor God, after having done so, will undo. And so now they've come to the brink of the river, and Joshua says to the priests that are bearing this ark, when your uh, feet stand at the brink of this river, and when they touch this water, the water's going to come back this way, and the water's going to come back this way. It's going to form a heap. And now, you men that are carrying this ark, you're to step down into this Jordan, and it's going to be dry land. And when you're in this Jordan on this dry land, you are to hold level and to hold high this ark of the covenant. And he says to all of these people now, you're going to pass over. And I don't know if they had a single file line or if they just all the way down the bank crossed over at the same time, but the Bible said they passed by the Ark of the Covenant. So I'm pretty well sure that somehow, if it wasn't a single file line, it was pretty close to that. And here they go, one at a time perhaps, passing over in front of this Ark. And as they're passing over, remember that blood is on that mercy seat. And it's really the blood that that makes a way for them to pass over. And as they get on the other side over here, when the last person comes up, Joshua has instructed some to take 12 stones and to put them in the Jordan. And Joshua himself takes 12 other stones out of the Jordan. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's just the other way around. They go in and take stones out of the Jordan and bring them over here. 12 men did that. And then Joshua takes stones that were from here and puts them back in the Jordan. And these stones over here are to be a memorial so that in time to come when people would say, what do those mean? They could tell their children, they could tell their ancestors, you and I, the story would go on that we passed over the Jordan because the blood on top of the mercy seat paved a way for you and I. Now, let's go back for just a moment, and I don't want to spend a lot of time with this, uh, but I need to get Elisha and Elijah in this picture. Now, Elijah was the man that came on the scene, if you recall, in the Old Testament and said to Ahab, the most wicked king that Israel had ever known, said to him, it is not going to rain for three and a half years at the word of God. And so there was a drought. You remember how Elijah had performed miracle after miracle after miracle. Now, Elijah, and, and I'm going to summarize this very quickly, Elijah is up in age, and Elijah knows his time on this earth is really short. And so he has a 
protege. He has someone in the wings. Moses had Joshua. Elijah has Elisha. And Elisha now is going to follow in the footsteps of Elijah. And Elijah brings them to the Jordan River, the same Jordan that the children of Israel would cross over. Uh, And so when he brings them to this place, he says to Elisha, he said, now I want you to tarry here. They cross the Jordan. And when they cross the Jordan, they cross because Elijah takes his mantle and he strikes it and the waters parted and they go to the other side. They're in Gilgal now. Remember when Joshua and the children of Israel crossed over, they were in Gilgal. That was the first city that they came to. And hold that thought. So now here is Elijah and Elisha in Gilgal. And Elijah says to Elisha, uh, they almost sound the same, don't they? Elijah says to Elisha, uh, I'm going to leave here, Jordan, and I'm going to Gilgal, and I want you to stay here. And Elisha says, not so. You're going, I'm going. And so they go to Gilgal, or from Gilgal, they go to Bethel. And the same message is given to Elisha. God has sent me from Bethel, and he wants me to go to Jericho. And, uh, and he said, I want you to stay here uh, in in." Uh, in uh, whatever city I just said. I want you to stay here. And then he says, I'm leaving here and and God is going to take me to Jericho. I'm leaving Bethel. And he said, no, I'm not staying in Bethel. I'm going with you. When he gets to Jordan, he retraces his steps and he goes from Jordan or Jericho rather back to Bethel, back to Gilgal. And he said, God has sent me to Jordan. And so when he gets to Jordan, they're about to uh, 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 cross over and the Bible said that Elijah takes his mantle and strikes the water and the water parts again just like it did when Joshua brought the children over here. So the water is parted and the two of them cross over on dry land. The water closes behind them and Elijah looks to Elisha and he says to him, what would you have me to do for you when I die, when I'm called away? And Elisha, uh, evidently that was a free ticket to ask anything that he wanted to ask. And so he looks at him and he says, I want a double portion of the spirit that I see God has given you. Because remember, he's made a journey with him. He's followed him. He's gone along the way and he's refused to stay put. That ought to be a great lesson to you and I to follow the Lord and never to stay put, but to always be in the footsteps of the Lord. And he said, I want a double portion. And and, and just as a little side note, if you go study the life of Elisha, you'll find that he did exactly the same, uh, double the miracles that Elijah did. He got a double portion of that spirit. And so now they're on their journey. They've crossed this Jordan. And and here's what Elijah says back to Elisha. Elijah, Elisha says, I want a double portion. He said, if you see me taken from you, then your your request will be granted. And just within a matter, evidently, of minutes, maybe hours, uh, all of a sudden, the Bible said a great chariot comes, a chariot of fire grabs a hold of Elijah and takes him to glory. And all of a sudden, his mantle's on the ground. Elisha picks it up, goes back to the Jordan, and claims the God of Elijah and strikes it and the waters part again. That's the point I want you to see. Joshua had the waters parted. Elijah had the waters parted coming this way. Elisha has the waters parted going back over this way. Now let me bring you to what I read. Uh, We talked about the mercy seat and we talked about the blood and we talked about um, this great experience that Elisha has, has had because Elijah is caught up to God. Now, here comes uh, Jesus uh, walking toward that same Jordan. And I'm of a mind to believe that he walked through Gilgal to get there. Remember, he's over on this side now. And as he's walking, he comes through and probably comes through Gilgal and comes to the Jordan River. And his cousin, six months older than him, John the Baptist, uh, is baptizing in the river. And John is baptizing the baptism 
baptism of repentance. And as he lays these people in the water and fully submerges them and raises them up, they're being baptized unto John's baptism. But here comes Jesus walking, and all of a sudden John sees him. Now, you've heard me preach this, and I've never heard anybody else preach this. I guess they're not as ignorant as I am. But if you think about how did John, according to the New Testament, uh, best I can tell, John the baptizer and Jesus being first cousins. Remember, John was Elizabeth's son. And you, you're going to hear about that probably at Christmas time. And here's Jesus, the son of Mary. So, and Mary and Elizabeth are, are sisters, uh, or cousins, I guess it was, wasn't it? Uh, anyway, they're related. Uh, and, and, and when uh, uh, the scripture said, uh, Mary makes a journey to the house of Elizabeth, and the Bible said when she spoke her salutation that was a greeting the Bible said the babe leaped in the womb of Elizabeth and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit now if John is in the womb of his mother and Jesus is in the womb of his mother and later on if they've never seen each other and I don't know if that's true or not but according to scripture I can find nowhere that they ever are mentioned together if they've never seen anybody when John sees Jesus Jesus coming, he makes the greatest proclamation man could ever make. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. How did he know that? Because their spirit uh, bore witness with one another when Jesus came in the womb of Mary and John is in the womb of Elizabeth. The, Bi- the Bible said the babe leaped in Elizabeth's womb. Why? Because I believe the spirit was transferred. And I'm going to tell you this and you can Laugh at me if you want, but I believe John the Baptist was the only man that was born again before he was born. Now take that home and chew on it for a while and see what you come up with. If you come up with anything better, you let me know. So here they are, and John says, Behold the Lamb. Now remember, why is this significant that John says this? Why is he calling Jesus a Lamb? Because if you remember back when they, were, they being the children of Israel, were in the wilderness and they were wandering, remember that the tabernacle was erected. And remember the high priest would take the blood of a Lamb, and he would approach, and he would come in behind the veil, and he would take that blood and he would sprinkle it on that mercy seed. That was the blood of a lamb. And now, as they're crossing over the Jordan, Joshua says, hold it high because it's got the blood of the lamb. And now Jesus comes, who is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And he comes into Jordan and he says to John, you need to baptize me. John says, no, not so, Lord. Lord, I've got need to be baptized of you. Jesus said, not so, you baptize me. Now, we all know that Jesus never needed to be saved, and he never needed to join the church. He was the one that instituted the church. So why was he baptized when he submitted to that baptism, and John took him and laid him in the water? It was symbolic of that ark going down into the Jordan River. It was symbolic of the death of Jesus Christ uh, that freed me and you from sin. Uh, And then when John uh, raised him back up, uh, remember that when they got on the other side, uh, remember that Joshua said to those uh, that bore the ark, uh, you come up now out of Jordan. Uh, And when they came up out of it, uh, symbolic of the resurrection, uh, Jesus was saying, I have come uh, to die for you, uh, but I will not stay in the tomb. I'm going to be raised and I will establish Christianity that can claim a Savior that has never stayed in the tomb, never is going to be found dead again. He's alive forevermore and the scripture depicts him that way. And what happened at Gilgal? When they got to Gilgal, remember, I believe Jesus probably came back through Gilgal, came to the brink of the Jordan Remember what Gilgal means? Joshua said that Gilgal means rolling away. He said this day, when they crossed over, he said this day has the reproach of Egypt 
been rolled off of you. Egypt meant bondage. Egypt meant that like you and I in sin are in bondage. And Egypt depicts that. It typifies that. And so Gilgal says, when you've crossed over, you're no longer in bondage. You're no longer a sinner. You're now a sinner saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. Well, thank the Lord for that. If it weren't for that, you and I'd be on our way to hell. But I'm glad today that God has saved us and God has redeemed us and God has everlastingly said, you are my child because I am the lamb that comes to take away the sin of the world. I'm the sacrifice that's come. You all, I'll tell you what. If anybody ever accuses you of not being a missionary Baptist, you send them my way. I'll, I'll vouch for you. But if that don't move your heart, you're unmovable. I, sometimes I don't understand. Anyway, that's between you and God. But let me tell you something here. Now let's go back to that moment that Elijah and Elisha cross over. Remember the Bible said when they came back, they're over here now in Gilgal, and they're coming back to Jordan, and God has instructed Elijah to come, and Elijah strikes the water, and the waters part. And they walk over on the other side just like Joshua and them parted and went over this way. They're coming back on this way. And remember he said, if you see me leave this world, uh, your desire will be granted. And, and I told you probably in just a few minutes or just a, just a little while as they walk together, the Bible said chariots of fire come. Why is that important? Because when you and I come to Chile, Jordan, on the moment that we're about to leave this world, and some of us don't have much time left, and when we come to this place, one thing we can count on is that we've never been this way before. That's what Joshua told the people. Leave a little space between the Ark of the Covenant and in yourself, you've never come this way before. But I'm glad to tell you, the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy, and the blood of Jesus has come this way. And when you and I come to that time in our lives to die, when we're going to go up like Elijah did, bless God, we have an assurance that Jesus Christ will be there to meet us, to let us cross over. Have you ever heard people say the death angel will come after you? Maybe so. I don't know. Here, here's my thought on this, and, and I'm going to close. I believe when death comes, I don't believe there's an angel that comes after us. I believe Jesus comes. I, 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 that's, I really truly believe that. I've had personal testimonies from people that have reassured me of that, but that's what I believe. And one of the reasons I believe that is that very scripture that I preached to you this morning. When they came, when they passed over, they passed in front of the ark with that mercy seat and that blood there. Let me tell you what I think happens. Now I'll close with this. Every single one of us in here tonight has had a loved one that's died. Some were sick. Some were ill. Some, some knew their time was drawing short. Some were old and probably their bodies had worn out. Some were young and vibrant and in the very uh, middle of their life. Suppose. Some of them were very, very young. But you see, death knows no age limit. And when death comes on this side of Jordan, death is, it, death is bad. Because, you know, when we cry, it, and if our loved one has been saved by God's grace, we know where they're going, don't we? We know they're going to heaven. And that brings us some kind of assurance. But I'm here to tell you, on this side, our hearts ache. On this side, it's troublesome. On this side, it hurts to think that that relationship will no longer be able to interact with that person. Person. But let's think of it this way. When that person is just about to take their last breath, here comes Jesus. And, and have you ever seen somebody? I've seen a lot of people at the last moment of death. I've held their hands as they've left from this side of glory to the other side of glory. Uh, I, my father lay on a bed and, and I had just gotten back to the hospital and I could tell by, by the way he, he looked and I felt him and I knew that his last moments were there and I got up as close as I could to his ear and I said, Daddy, it's all right. It's okay. Just, just You don't need to suffer anymore. Let's go ahead and cross 
on over. Let me tell you what I think happened. I think Jesus came. Let me tell you a story that, I, that might relate you to this, and then I promise I'll close. Uh, years and years ago, in fact, uh, I had just started preaching, and, and there were two preachers, not myself, two other preachers that were called to a home of a woman who was dying, and, and just a young woman. And uh, when they got to that home, uh, the family was gathered round, and, and one of them said, why, you could just feel death in the air. You could just feel how troublesome it was for that family. But in a, a few hours, just before this young lady passed away, they said her eyes opened brightly, and she looked over toward the wall, and, and, and a smile came on her face, uh, and she lifted her hand, something like this perhaps, uh, and she said, oh, where have you been? I've been waiting for you. And she looked at those around her, and she said, can't you see him? Can't you see him? Now, you can say, well, God gives people what they need when they die. God not only gives you what you need when you die, he gives you what you need when you live in. But uh, she said, can't you see him? And she reached out, and as her hand reached out, it fell to her side, and she took her last breath. Now, I believe that when that physical hand reached out, I believe the hand of her spirit never dropped to her side. I believe Jesus had a hold of it, and Jesus said, Oh, chilly Jordan, which represents death, you've not passed this way before, but now there's no space between us. Now you've come by my side. You take my hand. You see, I've been in Jordan before. I've died for the sins of the world. I was buried for three days, but I came out of here, and now you just cross over with me. You come to the other side, and the last moment that her foot was on that side, the next step was in glory. One of these days, I'm going to do like Elijah. I'm going from earth to glory, and I may have to go by way of the grave, but one thing you can rest assured, when my last step down here is over, I will walk on streets of gold. My body will go back to the grave. The grave worms will get it, but there's not a thing in the world that they can do with my spirit. The Bible said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and I'm going home one day. Are you going with me? Are you satisfied in your heart that Jesus is your Savior? If you're not, I tell you, I'd flock to this altar. I'd get here, I'd cry out to God, and I'd make my peace calling and election sure with the Lord before I left here today. That's enough. I can't come on. That's more. I'll talk. Stand up. That's enough. Now, I may have confused you more than I helped you. If I did, I didn't mean to. But I'll tell you what. If you just, if you didn't get a drop out of this, and by the looks of some of you, you probably didn't. But, but let me just share this with you. If you didn't get a thing out of this, thank you for bearing with me while I got blessed. Because I'm going over one day. I, I'm going... And I, I'm looking to take the hand when John said, Behold the Lamb of God. There was a time that I took the blood of the Lamb and I applied it to my heart. Oh, I didn't physically take it and do like they did back there in Egypt. But I believed in Jesus Christ. I believe that he died for my sin. And for my sin, I was going to believe that and trust that. And I'm going to heaven on that. If I end up in hell, I'll go through the blood of Jesus getting there. Because I believe with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength, that I one day will walk on streets of gold. Now, is the gold important to me? No, I've got a Savior that will outshine it all. You see, there's no need for light there because the Lamb's the light thereof. Isn't that wonderful to think about that? Now, i got to stop. I, I don't have enough breath to go on. I, there's a couple of more things I'd probably like to say. I just don't have the breath to do it. But i tell you one thing, beyond a shadow of a doubt, when my time comes, and my time's not far down the road. I really believe that. It's not far down the road. Uh, when that time comes, my family gets word, or I may be at home when it happens. When my time comes, I want you to know something. I've made the crossing. I'm not going to wait till you come by a casket 
to make the cross the very moment that my last breath leaves this body, my first breath be taken in heaven. Now, I don't know what all that's about, but I know one thing. When I make the crossing, the reproach of Egypt will be completely rolled from me. I still struggle with the reproach of Egypt in this flesh, and you do too if you'd be honest. But I'll tell you what, one of these days, all of that reproach is rolled away. And all of that crossing on the other side. Now, think about it this way. <clears throat> when Joshua brought the children of Israel here, and the waters rolled back, and they walked through. When they all got to the other side, the waters closed in again. Jordan River still flows as far as I know today. Go back to the Red Sea when the children of Israel came out of Egypt. The Red Sea parted and they went through on dry ground. But then the Red Sea came back in. But one of these days, bless the Lord, when Jesus went down in the water and came up out of the water, Jordan parted for me because I believed and trusted in him. And when I cross Jordan, it'll never close back in on me because when I get to the other side, <clears throat> the way best I understand I'll not have a thought about you folks. That'd be enough to go to heaven for. <laughs> but when I get over here, I won't worry about anything that happened back here. I believe all that will be removed. And I believe that I'll have my eyes on Jesus. And when we live in the new heaven and the new earth, I don't think we just run around on fluffy clouds and play harps. I believe we've got responsibilities. But I'll tell you one thing I do believe with every ounce of my being. When I get over to the other side, there's no coming back. You see, Elijah went over, and Elijah came back. There's no coming back. When you get on the other side, you wouldn't want to come back. As much as you miss your loved ones, if you could talk to them right now, and if you had the power to say to them, listen, God's given me the, the authority to tell you if you want to come back, you come back. Every single one of them would say, no, I, I, I think I'll just stay here. You come see me. Let me tell you a story, and I promise I'll close. I've said that twice, haven't I? When my mother was in St. Vincent's Hospital, I was just shy of my 18th birthday. And uh, she had had a stroke and followed by a heart attack. The doctors didn't have the technology that they've got today, and so they told my dad and I, they said, she'll never leave here. I was working for a funeral home at the time, and just the thought came over me. Uh, in the garage area where we used to sit, there was a door that went into a preparation room where they prepared bodies. The thought came across me, your mother's body being there today. Just a few minutes later, the telephone rang. <clears throat> when the telephone rang, <clears throat> she, uh, the man that owned the funeral home came downstairs and said, your dad called. You need to get to the hospital right away. I didn't even have a vehicle. He gave me one of his. And the best way that I could tell, that funeral home used to be on 3rd Street, or on uh, Washington Street, right next to 3rd. The best way would have been to gone down Scott Street, got out to uh, La Pleasance Road, picked up 75, and went to the hospital. Before I realized what had happened, I was in the east end of Monroe. I, I, I guess I just wasn't thinking, or maybe God didn't want me to get there. When I, when I finally realized where I was at, I got on 75. I pulled up in front of the hospital. I turned it off, and I left the keys in it, and, I, and ran inside, and uh, I, I didn't care if they took the vehicle, what they did. I needed to get upstairs. When I got upstairs, walked in, one of the nurses saw me. She came around this way, and she said, your dad's over here. My mother's room was over here. And as I came around down the hallway, I heard him crying. And I looked at her, and she shook her head. And I knew Mommy had made the crossing. Now, I'm soon to be 66 years old. That's been about, best I can calculate, about 44 years ago. Sometimes I even struggle to remember what her facial features look like. But I'm just as sure going to see Mommy again as, as I'm standing in front of you. But let me tell you, before she died on Tuesday, 
The last time I got to see her was the night before on Monday. And as I stood by her bed, now I'm her only child, and we had a very special relationship. And as we talked, she said, uh, you know, I'm not going to live long. And I didn't want to hear that. I said, oh, Mommy, the doctors are, they're wrong. Look how good you're doing. And she was. She was doing really, really well. And, and you'll be out of here before long, and we'll be back to what we always did before, and everything will be fine. She said, but uh, I, I want to tell you something. You remember, and, and she'd been there about 30 days, and uh, when she first went in, shortly after that, she went into a coma. And they told us, you just come and go in ICU as you want to because she's not going to make it. Well, she came out of that coma. And uh, we were allowed back there, but I was in the waiting area uh, just resting. My dad was back there with her. And she said to, to dad, she said, you know that family Bible we got? Uh, I want you to look for a picture in there because she said, I have seen a city. And she said, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And she said, I'm, I'm going there soon, and I want you to see that picture. We looked all through that Bible, and there was no picture of what may have been heaven. But that night when I stood by her bed, she looked at me and she said, you know how much I love you. I said, well, Mama, yeah, I, I know that. She said, but Larry, what I saw when I was in that coma she said, that's the, that's the prettiest thing I've ever seen in my life. Radiant. She began to describe it. And she said, as much as I love you, listen to this closely now, as much as I love you, I can't stay here. I've got to go there. Now, I don't know about you folks, but the love me and my mother had for one another, and she's ready to leave me and go to that place, I want to go there one day. I want to get there one day. And the way I'm going to get there is by the same blood that she got there by. I'm not going because mommy was a good woman, because daddy was a good woman, because my last name is Head, and because I preached the gospel for a long, 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 long time. I'm not going for those reasons. I'm going because Jesus is the reason, and he's the blood. And bless God when we all get to heaven. So I'm making the point, your loved one wouldn't want to come back. But one thing I believe your loved one would say to you, live for Jesus. Love him with all your heart. And you come to where I'm going. You come to where the Father's at. You come to where Jesus is. And one day, one by one by one by one, right now we're making the cross, aren't we? But one of these days, a loud trumpet's going to sound. When that loud trumpet sounds, the skies are going to split and Jesus is coming. We're not going one by one then. He's gathering us up and all of them, those bodies that have gone to the grave, those souls are coming back, unite with that body, that body be changed to a glorified body and they begin to rise and the Bible said those of us that remain shall not prevent them. That word prevent means you'll not precede them. They've earned the right to go first but when they've gone, the Bible said we'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and all of us are going home to be with Jesus. You better get on the boat. You better get your ticket, as one preacher used to say, because without that, you can't go. Go ahead and sing something. This is one of them, if, if they don't sing, I'll just keep rambling. And uh, I've not set your field on fire anyway, so just uh, do what you want to do. You go home, go home. You when the last stay here, stay here. winds of sorrow have blown, There'll be somebody waiting to show me the way. That's a good song. Man. I won't have to cross Jordan. Alone. How many of you know you're crossing Jordan and you won't cross it by yourself? I won't have yes, to cross Not Jordan by alone. Jesus died.
set your field on fire too, didn't it? I'm going to get on you here. You want me to get excited about Jesus? You better get excited with me. Amen. Uh, we don't need to do anything with this. We already handled it a different way. God bless you, love you, appreciate you. You're at liberty to go. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Brenda, you want to just tell them what, uh, what you heard? And then Hoy told me that Don came home today. That's good news. They were telling me this morning that Jane's doing better out of some of the pain she was in. Now I don't know about anybody else. God bless you. Appreciate you. Love you. You're at liberty to go.